So we're going to dive into the unit circle this evening. But before we do that, uh, a little refresher on special right triangles, 30, 60, 90 right triangles, 45, 45, 90 right triangles. All right? These are the uh, foundational measurements for the unit circle. All right? So start off with the 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to actually start off with a an equilateral triangle. All right. Eh, doesn't really look equilateral. Eh, that's probably the best I can do. All right. So each one of the angles in this triangle are 60 degrees. All right, including that one at the vertex here. This is also 60 degrees. What we do is we drop an altitude. All right, so it's a line segment originating at the vertex and going to the base of the triangle. All right, and it's going to form a 90 degree angle with the base. All right, both parts of the base. Now, In doing so, it's going to bisect that vertex angle, right? So right up here where we had 60 degrees, it's now going to be 30. Oops, I'm going to put the marker on. 30 degrees each. All right. So if I know that in an equilateral triangle, all sides are congruent, right? So they're equal in length. I can designate these sides as whatever I want. All right, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to call this little line segment here, I'm going to call that X. All right. And we're really just going to focus in on this triangle right here. Because it's going to, whatever is true for this triangle is going to be true for the other one. Because if you drop an altitude, it's going to split the triangle into congruent triangles. All right. Even though it doesn't quite look that way in my picture. Uh, that is that is the way of it, right? So I'm going to take, uh, I'll use red, I guess. And I'm going to draw a nice triangle here. And I'm going to pull that out. And just put it over here for safekeeping, all right? But back to this triangle, the original one. If I know that this little line segment here is X, then this one also has to be X. which would make the whole side 2x. I don't know why I made it like a mini ellipse there. Oh man, this is brutal. I wanna at least try to make it look nice, All right? So the whole side here is gonna be 2x. All sides in a right, in, in an um, equilateral triangle are congruent. So if this side is 2x, this side has to be 2x, this side has to be 2x, all right? All the angles are congruent, but also the sides are congruent. Now, again, if I'm just focusing in on this triangle, okay, this one over here, pulling it out, I have measurements and I have angles, right? So I have a 30 degree angle up top. I'm gonna thin that out a little bit. Oops. I got a 30 degree angle up here. 60 degree angle over here, 90 degree angle over here. All right. I also know the sides are 2x and x. All right. So I can use the Pythagorean theorem to figure out the missing side. All right. We know Pythagorean theorem is a squared plus b squared is equal to c squared. All right. The a and b represent legs of the triangle. Hey, they're interchangeable. You can make one, one leg. Well, I'm going to call this one A squared, or, or really just the A part of A squared. This one I'm going to call the B. And we're solving for C. All right. Well, actually, no, we're not solving for C. Um, we're going to substitute in C and, and figure out what we need to figure out. It'll all present itself in a sec. All right. So the A squared is unknown. The B value is X. The C value is 2X. 
So a squared plus x squared is equal to 4x squared. If I subtract off an x squared from both sides, I get a squared equal to 3x squared. And if I want to get a all by its lonesome, I would take the square root of both sides, and I'm going to get a is equal to, I'm going to be stuck with a radical 3, but at least that x squared I can pull out. So we're going to say radical 3 times x. Or you could say x radical 3, but this is you know, a little bit nicer because it has the coefficient in front. All right? So that means that this side here, let me get my green highlighter back has to be radical three times X, all right? And that's gonna be, that's, that's the relationship. Whenever you're dealing with a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, the side opposite the 30 degree angle we designate as X, if we take that X value and multiply it by a radical three, that'll give you the side opposite the 60 degree angle. And if we take that X value and double it, we'll get the hypotenuse of the 30, 60, 90 right triangle. Right, so the rule is you have 30 degrees to 60 degrees to 90 degrees follows the relationship of X radical three times X and two X. All right, now we need to reconcile this with the unit circle, all right? And I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a minute. Because in the unit circle, even though you probably don't see any right triangles, you know, in the circle we drew last time, um, that there are right triangles that make up important characteristics or important uh, parts of that unit circle. All right. So I'm going to, we'll go back to the uh, 45, 45, 90 in a minute. But for now, let's look at the, let's look at the circle. All right. So we have all these points living in the first, second, third, and fourth quadrants, right? Last time we learned that if you have a circle with a radius of one, if you go out from center to any point on that circumference, the distance is going to be equal to one, all right? So... If I'm starting here at, oh, that just moved on me. If I'm starting here at the origin and I go out to the right one unit, that's going to give me coordinates of one zero. All right. If I start at the origin and go up, that's going to give me coordinates zero one. Everything else is really a reflection of that, but you can also reason it out the same way. Starting at the origin, going to the left one unit is going to give me coordinates negative one, zero. Starting at the origin, going down one unit would give me coordinates zero, negative one. All right. And we also talked about the angles going around the unit circle. All right. So the angles start off at zero. If we go up to this right angle here, let me just get rid of this uh, funky circle I have here now. We will have traveled 90 degrees. That's a quarter of a turn. If I do another quarter of a turn, I get to 180. If I do another quarter of a turn after that, I get to 270. And another quarter turn after that, I get to 360. All right. So this circle is really just kind of a template. Because you know, we're gonna we're gonna fill in all this information, and it seems like it's gonna take a while, but it, it really won't. All right. If you know your 30, 60, 90 right triangle rules, then this uh, this gets cleaned up pretty quickly. All right. We also learned that pi radians was equal to 180 degrees. Two pi radians was equal to 360 degrees. Extensions on those would be. 90 degrees, well, 90 is half of 180. So if I'm looking at this relationship here, 90 is one half of 180. So if I take pi and divide it by two, I would get a measure that's equivalent 
to 90 degrees, in, but in radians, all right? Now I could also look at it like, all right, so I know that 90 degrees now is valued at pi over two. So if I wanna get from 90 to 270, 90 times three is 270. So take that pi over two and multiply it by three and you'll get three pi over two. You can use those little dashes as fraction bars. I, I, I always go back and forth on that, All right? Uh, zero degrees and zero radians are equivalent because if you've traveled nowhere, yeah, how many different ways can we define nothing in, a, in terms of a movement? It would be zero. We, would, we will have covered zero radii around the circle, but we will also have covered zero degrees, All right? So that was the foundational stuff that we talked about last time, but now I want to incorporate some other angles, right? Now, looking at a 30, 60, 90 right triangle, we, we have a relationship that exists from angle to side within that 30, 60, 90 right triangle. We look at this and say, well, I don't see how on earth that would apply here, right? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna zoom in over here and I'm gonna drop an altitude. I'm just gonna get a uh, thicker marker here. I'm going to drop an altitude. To this location here. That's going to create a right angle. All right, and in doing so, we're going to create a right triangle. Let's try to make it look halfway decent. All right, so this is a 90 degree angle. I know it gets a little busy with the with the markings here and stuff. But I'm going to tell you that the first special angle in the unit circle, that's going to be 30 degrees. If we know that this is 90 degrees over here, then that means that this side has to be equal to 60 degrees. So we have a special right triangle. It's just kind of maybe not the way we would have expected it. All right. Now, in this special right triangle, I know the hypotenuse is valued at a one. If I could figure out the length of this side and the length of this side, I could figure out the coordinates, right? Because it would be horizontal movement followed by vertical movement, right? That's how you plot a point. Go to the left or to the right and then go up or down, right? So from that special right triangle stuff that we did a few minutes ago, I want to be able to pull something relevant that I could use to find the lengths of the sides here, All right? And when we do it this one time, you know, it, it'll seem like it's kind of a lengthy process, but there's some numbers that are going to emerge from here that you're going to look at and say, okay, well, if I just remember those, I'll be fine, All right? So I'm going to bring it back over here. I'm telling you based off of the diagram we just drew that the hypotenuse is equal to one. A little thick. All right, so the hypotenuse is equal to one. So I can work backwards here. If two x is equal to one, it, it, you know, if you're not if comfortable doing it in your head, you could just look at it and say, okay, well, if these two things are equal, two x is equal to one. That means x has to be equal to one half. And if x is equal to one half. And I can substitute that in right here. I would get radical three times one half, which I could also write as radical three over two. Professor, okay. one more time. How do you get the one? Because it's a unit circle, the length from the center to any point on the circumference has to be equal to one. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. So, we get a relationship here that opposite the 30 degree angle in the unit circle specifically, opposite the 30 degree angle is gonna be a measure of one half. Opposite a 60 degree angle is gonna be a measurement of radical three over two. And opposite the 90 degree angle will be a measure of one, all right? So that's what all of this is getting at. And like I said before, 
you know, you may just look at this and say, all right, I, I just got to remember these numbers. All right. And, and that's up to you. I just, I, I never like to just give that information without giving the explanation that goes along with it. All right. So if I know that opposite a 30 degree angle, we have a measure of one half. And so opposite, it's basically saying what line segment does the angle open out onto or project out onto, all right? So a, an actual projector is a pretty good way of um, reasoning this out because if I had a projector at the 30 degree point, where would it shine its light, all right? It would shine its light on that line segment I just drew an arrow to. All right, the same idea with the 60 degrees. If I shine a light outwards, where is it going to shine? It's going to shine down here to this horizontal line, which has a measure of radical three over two. So now I know that I'm going radical three over two units to the right, half a unit up. All right. This is our first set of exact values for the unit circle, All right? Now, fortunately, the unit circle, well, any circle is fully symmetrical. So we directly found these measures, but indirectly, we could find three other measures corresponding with this, but I'll get to that in a couple minutes. All right, the second angle going around the unit circle is also important, but we're gonna hop over that for a sec. That's the 45 degree angle, All right? We'll come back to that in a couple of minutes when we talk about the 45, 45, 90 right triangle. The next one after that would be 60 degrees. Now the diagram gets pretty crazy pretty quickly. And let me do this in a different color. I'm gonna go, uh, I'm gonna go with a green for those keeping score at home. All right. If I do the same thing, so I'm going to draw a triangle and then almost immediately erase it. Because like I said, this gets pretty messy pretty quickly. But if I draw a right triangle with its base on the x-axis, it's going to have a measure of 60 degrees over here and a measure of 30 degrees up here. So it's actually gonna be the reverse of what we just came up with, all right? Which is why I can take this picture out and just say, okay, well, if it's 30 degrees as a reference angle on the x-axis, then the vertex angle has to be 30. Where 30 is in my blue triangle is now gonna be replaced with a 60 where the 60 is, is now gonna be replaced with a 30. So essentially these two measures flip flop, all right? So this becomes one half and this one becomes radical three over two, all right? Now explanations are a wonderful thing, but at some point you have to, you have to remember this, all right? So I'm gonna show you some mnemonic devices that are gonna help you remember, all right? But also, and we talked about this briefly last time, Anytime you find coordinates on the unit circle, x, y, those are going to correspond to cosine of theta, comma, the sine of theta, right? Where theta is the angle on the circle. Well, actually, I'm just. I'll call it what it is. It's the reference angle. All right, cosine theta comma sine theta where theta is the reference angle. All right, what that tells me is if I were to find, because this is a 30 degree reference angle over here, if I were to find the sine of 30 in my calculator, it should give me a result of one half. All right. Oh, cosine of theta should give me a radical three over two. We usually do cosine first, 
but most people think sine first before they think cosine. Either way, uh, you just got to make sure your calculator is in the right mode, right? You're always going to have to double check that. At the top of the screen there, upper left-hand corner in the calculator, you'll see DEG, right? And that little orange ribbon, left side, DEG for degree, right? If you don't see that, you go into settings. And the very first option is angle measure, right? The default is radian, which we'll find value in as we go. But for now, we just want degrees, All right? That's something we talked about last time, but it was worth bringing up again. Get rid of that. So if I do cosine of 30, radical 3 over 2. So that's this measure here. If I do sine of 30, I get 1 half, which is this measure over here. If I do cosine of 60, 1 half, that's this measure over here. Sine of 60, oops, radical 3 over 2, that's this measure over here. All right, so we have two little bits of the unit circle taken care of. But then it's like, okay, well, what about that 45 degree angle? We're going to do something with that. So for that, we go to a 45, 45, 90 right triangle. To create a 45, 45, 90 right triangle, all you have to do is make a right triangle with two congruent angles. You could draw it any way you want. I tend to do it this way. 45, 45, 90 right triangles are also known as isosceles right triangles. Oops. Love the oops. All right. So... 45, 45, 90 right triangle. I'm going to bring it in in a second here. But if I designate one of these sides that I know is congruent to the other, because these two sides have to be the same definition of, of, of isosceles, two congruent, uh, two congruent sides, but two congruent angles also. This side would also have to be X. These angles would have to be 45. They're congruent to each other. And all the angles in a triangle have to add up to 180 degrees, right? So that means after the right angle has been accounted for, we're looking at 90 remaining degrees to split evenly among the two remaining angles, right? So using the Pythagorean theorem again, I'm going to just kind of shift this out of the way a little bit. Let's tuck it in on over here. I would say, again, A squared plus B squared is equal to C squared. These two values, because they're legs of the right triangle, would go in for A and B respectively, or irrespectively. It doesn't matter because they're equivalent. So I would say X squared plus X squared, and I have no idea what this side is here, so we'll just leave that as C squared. So that's 2X squared is equal to C squared. If I take the square root of both sides, I get radical two times X is equal to C. If you remember with quadratics, we always, when we took the square root, we, we said plus or minus, but in a geometric context, we don't, we don't wanna do that because we don't wanna have a neg negative length of a side. In geometry, a negative would only indicate direction. So we could still have negatives, just not when it's a standalone geometric figure, All right? Bottom line is this line segment now has to be radical two times X. So that brings us to something similar to what we were talking about before, 45, 45, 90 right triangle that would have measures of X, X, radical two X. All right, that side that's opposite the 90 degrees is the hypotenuse and every single possible hypotenuse in the unit circle has to have a value of one. So I could do the same thing I did before, a little side work here to say that radical two X
is equal to one, divide both sides by radical two, and I get X is equal to one over radical two. I could leave it like that, but there's a little mnemonic that'll help out a little bit if we go into a uh, rationalized form. So this is the same as saying radical two over two, right? You, you remember rationalizing, you multiply top and bottom by whatever the radical is, right? If not, at least I could demonstrate that this is the true statement. One over radical two. Num works will convert it over for you right away, which is really nice, All right? So I'm gonna say radical two over two, radical two over two with the hypotenuse of one, All right? So if I draw a 45 degree angle, well, it's already drawn for me, but if I make that into a 45, 45, 90 right triangle, the two legs and ultimately what these are, the horizontal and vertical distances, whether I'm going like you see there, or if I'm going up to this location, it's representing the same thing, a horizontal movement followed by a vertical movement. Those are the legs of the right triangle. So the measures for this one have to be radical two over two, radical two over two. All right. Now, I mentioned earlier that there would be a mnemonic that would help us with this. So if you look closely at the X coordinates, you see that they decrease. All the denominators are two. Let me get a uh, fresh new color in here. I'm going to go with a little orange action. Oops, I said the X coordinates. All the denominators are two. The numerators decrease from radical three to radical two. And this last one over here, we could look at as radical one, but radical one simplifies to one, all right? It's the reverse order for the Y values. So if you know really this progression here, going from here to here to here, then you do the same thing going back in the opposite direction. Not very vibrant, so I'll do it with a thicker one. So start with here, work your way over, it's supposed to be an arrowhead, and then follow that same progression just going in the opposite direction. So here, and then go this way. All right. Now we could use that to figure out all the remaining angles in the unit circle. I'm sorry, we, we'll get to the angles in a minute. Coordinates is what I meant to say. So if I'm taking this point here, I mentioned earlier that the unit circle is fully symmetric. So this point over here is going to be a reflection over the y-axis. All right, so this is a reflection over the y-axis. Whenever you reflect over the y-axis, you negate the x value. So radical three over two would become negative radical three over two. This is where my penmanship goes off the rails, so just bear with me. Negative radical three, oof. over two, the Y value isn't gonna change, right? The height off of the X axis hasn't changed, so there's no reason the Y value should change. So that's just a one half. Same idea for the second coordinate, flip it over the, the, the Y axis, you get this coordinate over here. We negate the X value and leave the Y value alone. And we would do the same thing with the green one. I think I get a different shade of green here. Uh, I, I'm not using arrowhead there. All right, so and negate the X value 
and keep the Y value as is. So in terms of coordinates, I have half the unit circle completed. Whenever you reflect over the X axis, you negate the Y values and leave the X values alone. I got to find the right, uh, the right green here. I think it was that one. Add to preset. All right, so if I take this point and shoot it on down the line here, try that again. That's going to go to this location. We negate by reflecting over the x axis, we negate the y values, leave the x values alone. So this will be negative one half, negative radical three over two. And by the way, this diagram, as you can see, is already it's getting pretty busy, but um, but I didn't invent the unit circle. But you can just Google it. You'll see a unit circle completed, and I'm sure it'll look much better than this. But this is me showing you how it comes into existence. All right, so just going to get my my lines in here. All right, so if we negate the y values only, we'd have negative radical two over two, negative radical two over two, negative radical three over two, negative one half. So we have three quarters of the unit circle completed for, for the most part. I mean, we, we still have to do angles, but if you look at the progression, you see that in each quadrant, as you work your way away from the x-axis, so if I were to go in this direction in the second quadrant, this direction in the first quadrant, this direction in the third quadrant, and this direction in the fourth quadrant, see the progression is three, two, one, radical three, radical two, radical one, and then send it on back the other way starting with a radical three, radical two, radical one, and ending with a radical one. Now, we run into a little bit of an issue. It's not terrible. It's just, we do have to be mindful of the signs, right? Whether it's positive or negative. So then, you know, like, how do we know that? Well, it goes back to the ASTC stuff we were talking about last class. So only the sign function well, in, in the first quadrant, everything's positive. Second quadrant, only the sine functions are positive. So if I told you earlier, well, I did tell you earlier that this is cosine of theta. And this one is the sine of theta. The cosine should be negative. So the X value of each coordinate should be negative. The Y value should be positive because the Y value corresponds to the sine function. All right. And that's the same in every quadrant cosine first then sine so in the third quadrant only tangents positive so again cosine sine only the tangents positive in the third quadrant so it would make sense that cosine and sine would both be negative right and that's for each ordered pair not just the one i'm designating in blue all right these also are the result of cosine and sine we'll just have to talk about angles in a minute but if we know that information, we know the progression, we can easily fill out a unit circle. And if you get to a point where you could easily fill it out, then eventually you'll be able to visualize it without having to write it out. And that'll help you um, definitely, I mean, Calc 1 a little bit, but Calc 2, Calc 3, especially Calc 3, All right? So uh, there's value in this. Now, again, I, I say this uh, a bunch of times, if this is your last stop, mathematically, then we're we're learning for the sake of learning, right? But if you're going the distance here, you know, you're going to go up to Calc, Calc 3, well, at least at WCC, uh, maybe a little bit of linear algebra comes up again. Uh, but then, you know, like you go beyond, you know, what we offer here at the college and you go to a four-year institution, you're going to see all, all this stuff coming back over and over and over again, all right? Professor, I have a question. Sure. Um, well, 
do you know if WCC offers Cogliz in the summer? It, uh, yeah, it's offered. Uh, we just did the course. Oh, actually, we did it for the fall. It, it should be. It should be posted. Already. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I already. I already have. Oh. What, what's that? Say it again. Because it says that the summer schedule will be posted on February twenty eighth. So I'm oh, gonna... I yeah. jumped the gun. All right, so tomorrow. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, they they offer Calc one, Calc one, two, and three. Uh, the Calc three course doesn't always run though, because it it's based off of enrollment. But Calc one and Calc two, at least every time I taught it, there was plenty of students there, so the course will run. Okay, thank you. No problem. All right, so going into the fourth quadrant, again, I'm just, I'm making a mess out of this, but it's it's with good intention or intentions. So every point in the third quadrant gets reflected and ends, ends up being a corresponding point in the fourth quadrant. Now, that being said, you could have reflected from the first quadrant to the fourth quadrant directly. Again, if you reflect over the y-axis, you negate x. So this is radical 3 over 2, negative 1 half, radical 2 over 2, negative radical 2 over 2, and then um, 1 half, negative radical 3 over 2. All right, so now we have every single angle in the unit circle, and that, that's that's not entirely true. I mean, there are there are non 30, 45, and 60 degree reference angles. I mean, you could technically have an angle of like 14 and a half degrees, but these are the, the, the most important ones, the special ones. All right. So yeah, it, it got it got pretty messy pretty quick. In a in a couple minutes, I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of all of these um these lines showing you how to get from one quadrant to the, the next, just so I could have something kind of fresh to work with. But we can determine fairly easily the angular measurements as we go around the circle. All right. So, and you know what? Before, yeah, yeah we'll, we'll complete this unit circle, but then I'm going to do it again real quick for you with a fresh unit circle just to show you. All right. Uh, and, and by that, I mean, show you how quick and easy they sh you'd be able to do this, All right? Um, as you go around the unit circle, we start off at zero degrees. We increase to 30 degrees, then increase to 45 degrees, increase to 60 degrees, and increase to 90 degrees, All right? So if we start off increasing by 30, That'll get us to 30 degrees from zero. Then we increase another 15 degrees to get to 45, another 15 degrees to get to 60, and then another 30 degrees to get to 90. All right. And that progression holds true throughout the entire circle. So if you start off at a quadrantal, remember quadrantal means an angle that falls on an axis. If you start off at a quadrantal, increase whatever that measure is by 30 then 15, 15 again, and then 30. And that'll get you where you need to go, all right? Uh, like I said, let me get rid of all this uh, this stray stuff here. All right, so increase by 30. So again, it was plus 30. plus 15, plus 15, plus 30, all right? So 90 plus 30 is 120. Let me stay with my color scheme here. Plus 15 gets me to 135, plus another 15 gets me to 150, plus another 30 gets me to 180. So that 180, plus 30 gets me to 210, another 15 degrees, 225, another 15 degrees, we get to 240, another 30 degrees, we get to 270. 
starting with 270, increased by 30. Oh, color scheme got out of whack here. Increase 270 by 30, we get to 300. Increase by 15, we get to 315. Increase by another 15, we get to 330. Increase by 30, and we get to 360. So start off at whatever quadrantal angle you're at. Increase by 30, 15, 15, 30. And that'll get you, you work that way all the way around the circle and you get, you get the completed circle. But now we need the radian measures. And there's, there's a bunch of different ways to remember how to do this. Uh, computationally, we talked about it last time, but if we know the relationship between a radian measure and a degree measure, it's, it's pretty easy, right? Because it's just a matter of figuring out what fraction of 180, for example, your given angle is, that should be the fraction of the, the pi value, all right? So we know that these two are equivalent. Uh, I haven't used yellow in a while. So we know these two are equivalent. Pi radians is equal to 180 degrees. So then I would ask myself, so, what fraction of 180 is 30? Because I'm starting way back over here. And if you don't know, you just do a quick 180 divided by 30, right? 180 divided by 30 is equal to six. That means six goes into 180, I'm sorry, uh, 30 goes into 186 times. So I could also look at it and say, well, if I wanna get 180 to become a 30, I could just, I don't like it when it does that. I could just multiply it by one sixth. One sixth of 180 is equal to 30. Pi radians is equivalent to 180. So I would be taking pi and multiplying it by one sixth. So pi over six. All right. Now we all we we have the rule. We talked about this last time. If you want to convert from degrees to radians, you just multiply by pi over 180. And if you want to convert from radians to degrees, you multiply by 180 over pi. That, that's fine. But this way, it'll get you, get you where you need to go a little bit quicker. All right. So now I can just kind of build off of that and say, all right, well, if I want 60 degrees, 60 is twice 30. So I'm going to take twice this number twice pi over six is two pi over six, which is gonna to reduce to pi over three. All right, so it was two pi over six. It reduces to pi over three. And that's really kind of a nice feature because in NumWorks specifically, because yeah, it'll give you the decimal value, but it'll also simplify it for you, all right? If I want to get, and we'll, we'll deal with the 45s in a minute. If I want to get from, let's get my highlighter back involved here. Pi over three, I'm sorry, uh, 60 to 120. 120 is double pi over three. So that's two pi over three. I'm basically just taking whatever the number that I'm looking for, like the next one I'm gonna look for is 150 and see if I could find something that'll help me get there. Like, for example, if I take 30 and multiply it by five, I'll get to 150. So I'm gonna take my pi over six, multiply it by five, five pi over six, and that's gonna get me to a radian equivalent of 150 degrees. Same idea with the 210. I'm gonna take, well, I would ask myself, how can I get from 30 to 210? Multiply by seven. So seven of those pi over sixes will get me to 210. All right. If I want to get a 240, I can do that with a 30. I would need eight of those pi over sixes, which is equivalent to four pi over three. I could also look at it and say, well, 
240 is double 120 and 120 is two pi over three. So double that you get four pi over three, All right? It, it's, it's just working with the numbers. And you know, like, like I said, everybody's got a different mnemonic for this kind of thing. This isn't really a mnemonic. It, it, it's more like your reasoning based off of the information that's given. All right, I'll show you like a real mnemonic in a minute. 300, 300 is 10 of those 30s. So 10 pi over six, which reduces to five pi over three. Again, my um, color scheme went off the rails here. So I'm just taking a second to clean it up. All right. So then 330, well, 30 times 11 will get me 330. So 11 of those pi over sixes. So 11 pi over six. Now 45, so now we're going back to the 45s. 45 is equivalent to a quarter of 180. All right, so if I take 180, multiply it. Uh, let me use parens here. Multiply by one quarter, I'll get 45. 180 is valued at pi radians, so a quarter of pi pi over four, would be the radian measure for that. So then I could, I could work off of that and say, okay, well, how can I get from 45 to 135? Maybe you don't know, but if you multiply 45 by three, you'll get to 135, right? So three of those pi over fours. If I wanna to get to 225, I'd multiply 45 by five. So I need five of those pi over fours. So five pi over four. And if I wanna to get to 315, I'll multiply by seven. This is more experience and just happen to know off the top of my head. So I'm gonna show you a way to not have to uh, <laughs> have seen problems before in order to know how to do them, you know? So, but seven of those pi over fours will get you to 315 degrees. All right. And so that's a completed unit circle. And that took about an hour to do. Let's see if I can do it in a minute instead. So I'm going to, this is all coming back in a second. I just need to do a screen grab on the, um, on the unit circle itself. So don't freak out when it all disappears. Oh no, an hour's worth of notes gone. Actually, I'm I'm like mocking the whole situation. I hope I don't lose it all. I don't think I will. I need a screenshot. And I'm gonna save the image. I'm going to put everything back the way I found it. The way I found it, imagine. I mean, there's so much on the screen right now that if this were just thrown at you and I didn't take the time to build it up, it's going to be like, well, what on earth? And in fact, if you go to Google and just put in unit circle, you'll see the whole thing in its full glory all typed out. You see a hundred different variations of it. It's intimidating when you see it for the first time and you're like, wait, I got to know this. But if you know how to build it, it gets a lot easier. Oh, not what I wanted. I need my picture. Picture being the word of the day. Picture. It's a good a word of day as any. Picture. All right. So. Now, I'm not going to clock it because if, if I do that, I'll, I'll probably make a mistake and end up uh, kind of disproving my point. But I'm going to use pretty much all those relationships I was telling you about as we as we were talking and um, and work my way around the circle. So first thing I'm going to tackle are the angles. So let's get, uh, I'm going to go black here. 
Start off at zero, increase by 30, 15, 15, 30, 30, 15, 15, 30. Increase by 30, 15, 15, 30. Increase by, you guessed it, 30. 15, 15, 30. All right, so now I have all my angles. The mnemonic for the radian measures. So we'll do radian measures next. The mnemonic there is, I don't know. Some people look at it and say, oh, I'm just going to, I'm just going to remember the ratios because sometimes, you know, like you, you study a shortcut, you end up studying more than you would if you were to actually just know the values, right? But if we look closely at the at the radian measures, you see the denominators are always six, four, three. Going out from the x-axis, six, four, three, six, four, three, six, four, three, all right? Now, you just remember six four three, but for those of you who like baseball out there, I always think it was six four three double play. It just kind of sticks in my mind. So six four three, six four three, six four three, six four three. All right. So we got the denominators. That's great. What about the numerators? Well. In quadrant one, the numerator is always equal to pi. So pi, pi, pi. In the second quadrant, the numerator is always one less than the denominator. So whatever my denominator is, subtract one from it, slap a pi on it, and you have the numerator. So five pi, three pi, two pi. In the third quadrant, the numerator, Again, they're, they're all going to have pi in them. So I'm just kind of glossing over that. Is equal to the denominator value plus one. So I'm going to take whatever my denominator is, add one to it and slap a pi on it. So seven pi, five pi, four pi. The weird one, I mean, I guess they're all weird, but in quadrant four, the numerator is going to be two times pi, uh, two times the denominator minus one. And that's why I'm saying, like, a lot of people will be like, oh, I'll just remember the angles because I, I now have to remember four new rules to help me as a shortcut. And it, it may not be worth it. All right. But if I take this denominator, double it and subtract one, I'm going to get five slap a pi on it. This one, double it, eight minus one, seven, slap a pi on it. Six, double it, 12 minus one, 11, slap a pi on it. The quadrantals, they're quarter turns. If we know, and this is exactly the same as it was before, it's not really a mnemonic device, it's just knowing the relationship, All right? 180 is pi radians, pi over two, is well 90 is half of 180 so pi becomes pi over two we're starting at zero if we're going quarter turns we have one pi over two two of those pi over twos three pi over two and then this one would be four of those pi over twos four pi over two is equal to two pi Going around, staying with the quadrantals, we know that 
This is one unit to the, unit to the right of the origin, not going up or down. One unit up from the origin, not going left or right. One unit to the left of the origin, not going up or down. One unit down from the origin, not going left or right. So then it just becomes those coordinate values. And that's what I was saying before. All of them are going to have denominators of two. So I'm using the um, the bar there as a, as a fraction. All right, everything's positive in the first quadrant. Only the sine functions are positive in the second, so the cosine value should be negative. Only tangents positive in the third, so both sets of ordered pairs should be negative. And only cosine is positive in the, in the fourth quadrant. Cosine is the x value, sine is the y value, so the y value should be negative. All right, still haven't put the numbers in. And this is way over a minute, but you get the idea. It's much quicker than what we were doing before. Rad three, rad two, rad one, and then circle back around. So rad three, rad two, rad one, which is one, circle back around, rad three, rad two, rad one. All right, over here. Rad three, rad two, rad one, rad three, rad two, rad one. And we're just repeating that process in every quadrant. All right. So rad three, rad two, rad one, rad three, rad two, rad one. And last but not least, rad three, rad two, rad one, rad three, rad two, rad one. All right. There are so many different shortcuts out there. Uh, somebody, I mean, I, I never really like this one, but there, there's one where you could use your index fingers to help you remember as you're going around the circle. Um, if you if you Google unit circle mnemonic devices, you're, you're going to see it, it, it's almost never ending. Somebody has a unique one that they think is the best, All right? But if you can have awareness of this circle, it it It'll take you where you need to go in terms of trig, all right? You'll, you'll be at an advantage going into the, the next course and the one after that and so on, all right? So like, I, I can't emphasize this enough. It really, really will pay dividends. You know, Because like I'm doing all this stuff here and you're like, it, rightly so. Well, couldn't I just type in like cosine of 150? Wouldn't that tell me? Okay, so 150 is right here. Again, cosine is the X value, cosine of whatever the angle is. Sine is the Y value. Like, couldn't I just type that in? Yeah. But the thing is, it's a difference between having good understanding of the concept and having good understanding of a calculator. Right. I, I just I always kind of looked at it like um, and, and I actually had my own story related to this when I, I took a linear algebra. I think it was linear algebra back like years ago. And there was a student in the class who was like a human calculator. So the teacher was would be and it wasn't simple cal calculations. It'd be like, what's the determinant of this matrix? So, you know, like fancy stuff. And that kid would be able to spit out the answer with like half a moment's thought. So that student was spitting out the answer before the rest of us could even put it in the calculator. You know, and, and so obviously that, that kid really knew his stuff and had the computational ability, but he was thinking beyond the calculation and he was thinking more of the theory. So, and, and that's the thing. When you're in calc one, two, three, it doesn't matter. When you're still trying to figure out oh, how on earth did that teacher get sine of 30 is equal to one half or a cosine of 135 is equal to negative radical two over two. There's going to be people spitting out those answers and, and it'll be like, 
I, I don't embarrassing is not the right word. It, it's it's disheartening, disheartening, because th there will be people that'll be like, of course, the cosine of 315 degrees is radical two over two. Of course, the cosine of five power over four is negative radical two over two. And you're going to be like, what do you mean, of course? How, how are you getting these numbers? All right. So the teacher is not going to be thinking in terms of, okay, well, half the class probably doesn't know their unit circle. So let me slow down and re-explain. I'm going to explain every little step. It's going to become, and, you know, depending on the, uh, I'll say the level of patience of the teacher or, and also demeanor, it could go from, hey, you know, maybe after class, we could sit down and talk about this because you really got to know this stuff to, I don't understand how you don't know this stuff already. How did you get into this class? You know, so like it it could run run the the spectrum from one to the other, and you never want to be put in a, in that situation. It's not like the teacher is going out of their way to like pretend that this is an important concept just so they can make you feel dumb. Like this is that important. So when you know, like you're finding the the roots of a function, and that function involves a trig equation, and you're like. And you get to that final, uh, you know, uh, maybe the penultimate step. Uh, so not the final one, but the one that, that'll get you to the final answer. And you see something like cosine of theta is equal to radical two over two. And people are like, okay, so that's going to be pi over four and uh, seven pi over four. And you're going to be like, how did you figure that out? Right. That that's That's the importance of stuff like this. Right, so that you can think beyond the computation and actually get to the nitty gritty of what the topic is talking about. Um, I'm not going to spend too much more time. Uh, I was going to say lecturing you, but that that's kind of what the job entails. Uh, we're going to only do a couple more examples because I want you to be able to take this home and like quote, quote unquote home um, and and really digest it because it will help you even in this course when it when it comes to um, uh, solving certain problems as we go forward, right? And in fact, I mentioned this last time, every single thing we do in this course from here on out is gonna come back to trigonometry. Will it come back directly to the unit circle? Not necessarily, but it will, it will very often, right? So we just did all of that. We talked about sine and cosine. Well, specifically cosine first, then sine. And then boom, right off the bat, tangent. Tangent of 135 degrees. You're like, you didn't teach us tangent. Uh, not in terms of the unit circle, but tangent of theta is equal to the sine of theta over the cosine of theta. All right, so that's a rule. All right, and I'll, I'll actually justify this rule for you real quick. You don't, I'm not going to ask you to do this, but it's just people like to know. All right, so Katoa, familiar with that. Sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse. Cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. And tangent is equal to opposite over adjacent. All right, if I take, and, and you know, this is the, the abbreviation for it. This is really saying sine of some angle theta is equal to the opposite side over the hypotenuse. Cosine of some angle theta is equal to the adjacent over the hypotenuse. If I take sine and divide it by cosine, I'm going to take the sine of theta divided by the cosine of theta and sine is equal to opposite over hypotenuse and cosine is equal to adjacent over hypotenuse. In a complex fraction, if the denominators are the same, you know, so a fraction over a fraction, if the denominators are the same, you could just cancel them right out. This gives us the ratio of opposite over adjacent, which happens to be the tangent ratio. Opposite over adjacent is tangent. So that allows us, whenever we need to find tangent, we could take the sine value 
of that angle, the cosine value of that same angle and divide them. So applying this rule would be tangent of 135 is equal to the sine of 135 over the cosine of 135. All right. Now here's some of that black magic I was talking about. Sine of 135 is the square root of two over two. Cosine of 135 is negative the square root of two over two. How did you get that? Well, I know my unit circle, but in a second, I'll show you where you can get it. All right, this simplifies down to negative one. All right, so tan 135, even the old school calculators for tangent, they, it would work to give you some nice values. You'd be like, oh, okay, I don't need to know a unit circle. Like I, 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 to be completely honest with you, when I was first learning trig, I want to say it was like second year, third year of high school, second year of high school. I was not a unit circle believer. Right? Those old scientific calculators, you know, they wouldn't give us nice radical answers, but they gave me the decimal answers. And those decimal answers came up often enough that I just remembered that when I saw a 0 0.8660, that was equivalent to the square root of three over two. Yeah, I just remember that. 0 0.7071 is equivalent to radical two over two. Like those, those are the two most common numbers that would come up. And so I would see, I type in the sine of 60 degrees and I get 0.8660. I'd be like, okay, so that's radical three over two. It wasn't until I started getting deeper and deeper into calculus where I'm like, I really better sit down and look at this unit circle, All right? But again, just going back, at this point, you would probably use the unit circle as a reference tool. Eventually, if you commit this to memory, you're, you'll be unstoppable mathematically. All right. You'll be one of those people that, that the other students in class are thinking like well, you're just a magician. All right. So sine of 135, remember, cosine is the x. Sine is the y. All right, so at 135, we want the sine. That's this number here. That's the radical 2 over 2. And then the other one, the cosine at that same angle, negative radical 2 over 2, simplify two opposite values divided is going to be equal to a negative 1. All right. Now, like I said, this is not me sh showing off or anything. It, it's I, I want you to get to the point where you could show off. So you look at this and say, sine of 150. Well, clearly I know that that's going to be whatever. Uh, as it turns out, it's going to be one half. But if you look at your unit circle, go to 150 degrees, find the sine value. Here's 150, the sine, the y coordinate is equal to one half. So I left a lot of space for something that should not require a lot of space. If you have at first, like I said, have the unit circle accessible, but then later on, take the time to try to commit it to memory, all right? Uh, 210, here's 210. I'm looking for cosine, cosine's the X value. That's negative radical three over two. Right, 315 degrees. Uh, highlighter, different color. 315 degrees is right here. Cosine is the X value, radical two over two. Right. If you ever get to the point where you're saying to yourself, I don't need a unit circle. I know the numbers, then, then you've, you've done everything I've asked you to do. Uh, some people like to create a table, a, a chart of values, 30, 60, 90, and so on, what they correspond to, you know, it's, it's like a tabular form. And that's all well and good, but eventually you need to get to the part, uh, the, the mindset 
of not only, and we talked about this last time, an angle is not just something that exists. We think of it as sweeping through an angle, right? So it's a location that is the result of sweeping through an angle. So when I go to my unit circle, I'm at zero degrees. If I want to go to 150, I don't just show up at 150. I sweep through an area until I end up with 150 degrees, right? So it's kind of like those old, uh, you know, like Top Gun or Iron Eagle, which I watched again last night for the first time in like 30 years. It's like the radar, that kind of deal. It's sweeping through an angle, right? It's just how many, you know, how many degrees is that angle, right? So if I'm starting here and I want to go to 225, 225, that's going to put me over here. I can now get the cosine and the sine, but I also have a sense of what it means to travel 225 degrees, right? That's where, if you can get there, that that's where things really, really start taking off. You know, applications in engineering. Um, well, I could say navigation, but it's really just like, I mean, if you're going to pilot a, you know, a plane, like you, you have the, uh, the yaw, the roll and the pitch, like those are all degree measures, right? So it's just uh, uh, projecting it up into the, the third dimension, but like it's all based off of degree movement, right? And how far you travel along that distance, that's that's a linear measure, but like having a sense of what 410 degrees looks like, you know, what it feels like. And sometimes people need to just kind of stand, I'm facing in one direction, Right, I'm gonna turn 410 degrees. What does that mean? So you you actually physically turn. Okay, I get an idea of what this is all about. All right. So between that and knowing the actual measurements, that is the the foundation of trigonometry. All right. So uh, next class we'll pick up with uh, with some of these practice problems. Uh, if you have time and you want to look at a few of them. Uh, the ones that I would recommend would be number five, seven, nine. And if, if you can look at the ones at the bottom, that's that's even better because it's now combining skills. To be honest, I don't really need these examples because they, they don't end up having uh, positive acute reference angles <laughs> that are special, as in. 30, 45, 60, you know, some of the unit circle values, really the emphasis was uh, unit circle measurements here, All right? So that's where we're going to pick up next time. And uh, like I always say, if you have any questions, stick around. Let me stop the recording or pause and stop the recording.